this is the big interview icons series. And, and don't try and think about nicking our title because nobody has ever before thought of calling a podcast the big interview. And the word icons is one we've invented on our own. So no touching. But this is still the series where we look back on legends who've been so ubiquitous in the 104 interviews we've done over the last six years that we decided to spotlight them because our guests spoke so brilliantly about these enormous footballing characters. This episode focuses on one of the best. They call him the King of Kings in a certain part of Glasgow. In Barcelona, they also call him Saviour, the man who rescued the European Cup final against Arsenal in Paris. Yes, it's Henrik Larsson. First met Larsson as he just joined Celtic as part of a small group of four or five on the day of his presentation, having been signed from Feyenoord, a long-haired midfielder, sitting in the stand at Parkhead, interviewing this guy who was a little bit reticent, but still articulate. I think he started his career a little bit um, jauntily at Celtic. I think he contributed to an own goal or some such thing, after which things went moderately well. The big deal for me is that I've interacted with him over the years. It's been wonderful watching his brilliant brain on the pitch. But when he moved to Barcelona, it was, I think, a shock for most people. My memory tells me that was 2004. And at the bottom of the street where our apartment was, yes, that famous apartment where Thiago and Rafinha and Massinho moved in, and I yelled at the two boys who are now at Barcelona and Liverpool. Well, at the bottom of that street, crossing the zebra crossing, going towards the Princesa Sofia Hotel, I bumped into Henrik Larsson, his wife Magdalena, and their youngest kid, then in a pram. Hello, I said. Welcome to the city. Hello yourself, he said. And I knew there was magic between us. In truth, um, I've had plenty of interviews with Henrik Larsson. I've chatted with him on behalf of Kev Bridges when Kevin lost his telephone in Iceland. No, not the shop. Yes, that's how weird my life is. Henrik's brilliant. Literally a brilliant footballer. And when he was at Football Club Barcelona, I've often told the tale... For a substitute player, which often he was, I'd never seen somebody, particularly a foreigner, have so much impact so quickly. When the camp now was full in those golden days before COVID, the roar that greeted the arrival of the Swede to warm up and then come onto the pitch was spine tingling. He was revered. It's been remarkable to watch. So, in this spotlight on our icon, who's now back at Barca on the bench helping Ronald Koeman, we're first going to hear from the aforementioned Kevin Bridges and his tale of Henrik Larsson and the defiled Glasgow bus ticket. Actor Martin Compson, yes, that man from Line of Duty, who seems to have established quite a nice life in Los Angeles, must be talented, reflects on his love affair with Celtic's magnificent number seven. Henke's fellow Swedish international, Jockey Bjorklund, then talks about his former teammate's football intelligence before Stilian Petrov, who, remember, is able to strip down a Bulgarian army rifle and put it back together blindfold. He says, talks about the high standards set by Larsson during his glorious time at Celtic. Chris Sutton rounds things off by comparing and contrasting his partnership with the legendary Swede to that of Alan Shearer, <coughs> don't like him, at Blackburn. This is a fabulous Icons episode. Don't steal the title. Do enjoy the content. At the end of primary seven, my dad came over to pick me up one day for school and he had two season tickets in the glove compartment. He had a letter, in fact, addressed to me and he said, you get a letter through. I'd never received a letter in my life, so I opened it and it was a season ticket. So... The first season I had a season ticket was the 97-98 season when Celtic stopped the 10 in a row. So my brother... Was that the Vim Janssen year? Aye. Oof. My brother had been through the whole nine years of Rangers dominance <laughs> and I rocked up right at the end. One season. Won, won the league in my first season. Who was your best player then? I mean, yours, not Celtic. Well, that was early Henry Larson. When it was Larson's was first right? season. So was, was Vim Janssen responsible for recommending Larson? Or, uh, no, Janssen... He'd come from Feyenoord, hadn't he? Uh, Janssen bought Larson. 650,000 something 
crazy anyway. Was a, there, he'd fallen out the fighting and there was a Aye. tribunal. You can't, you can't believe it now, Aye. can you? Because remember my dad, that was his, he goes, uh, my uncle George to say they were signing some guy, Larson. And my dad recognised the picture of him Seriously? for the USC 94 World yeah, Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Larson, I don't know if he had a, didn't he have a great tournament or something. There were, if you remember, we, I was at that tournament, they were a really functional team and they were tall and they athletic. Get to the semis? And he ran around massively. His hair was long and mental and maybe like it was. They finished third. You know, so they won the it, third, fourth playoff. Maybe my dad paints it as he had a worse tournament than he did because older guys. My dad's got a sort of built-in resistance to anybody with a flamboyant haircut. So maybe that went against his USC 94 appraisal. <laughs> but my dad's words were, Larson, is that that wee diddy for Sweden? <laughs> that was his wee diddy for Sweden. That's what he, I don't know if you remember Larson's debut. He came on against Hibs at Easter yeah, Road yeah. and it was his slack pass that put Chick Charnley through in goal. Charnley scored. Yeah. Larson was at fault. And then we played Dynamo Batumi. <laughs> in the home leg, Larson scored an own goal. I think that was his second game. So he'd... Chick Charnley, they'd set him up for that goal and then scored their own goal. So my dad was, he's wee daddy for Sweden, I was... Dying. I called it, son. And then obviously the next did okay. seven years reversed that. What did you think of Larson, apart from the obvious <laughs> and the goals? I thought he was alright, aye. <laughs> was, uh, no, he was the best I've ever seen. I asked because yeah, I was leaving to go to London two weeks after he signed or three weeks after he signed. So we interviewed him and I didn't really see him again until he moved to Barcelona. So I didn't live in Scotland um, for all the time that he was King of Kings. And I was shocked that he took the camp now by storm and yeah. even in the days of Ronaldinho or whatever when he left the bus on a pitch as a, coming off as a substitute when he came on as a substitute nobody Eto Rivaldo when I'd been there Ronaldinho nobody got a throatier bigger roar of not just you're good we love you we believe in you Senate Larson who played a bit part at Barcelona the level of affection for him was just out of and I'm asking about it was a horrible, that day he left, I think it was Dundee United, the last game, and they'd done the lap of honour, projectile tears. <laughs> I, like, I remember it just... <laughs> see that wee, I've never heard that expression See that wee emoji, before. wee emoticon guy that you type <laughs> when, when you're, when you're shoe, laughing, <laughs> the wee yellow guy with the blue tears. <laughs> like that, except for no uh, laughter, it was brutal. It was a, a deep sense of loss about that day, that his last game. It is physically and emotionally painful when you lose somebody that important to you but from a football club. he could have played anywhere, I don't think anybody was... No Celtic fan was surprised when Larson went on to like have a pivotal performance, come off the bench in the Champions League, when he set up Belletti, didn't he? At Paris, Bolton. yeah. Even was it Henri came out at the end and said... Tonight, he played for Arsenal in the final, obviously, but he said, tonight I've never seen Ronaldinho, I've never seen Deco, I've never seen Eto'o. I've only seen one man make a difference, and that was Henrik Larson. An iconic figure, and because he could have went to any club, but he stayed with us for seven years, and you're never going to see that again. A guy who's going to come to Celtic and play even one season anywhere near the level, uh, Henrik Larson, he'll be off to West Brom or somewhere. Because of the because of money. Because of the money, aye. But Larson could, have, I'd imagine, he was still getting weighed. <laughs> Celtic could have paid a lot higher back then, but but they also incentivised him to stay. He they could easily a, have moved on for. They put a golden goodbye at the end of the contract, which is why he stayed, and it was very you know, it was lucrative for him to stay, but. Don't say that, Graham. Now you're through your pain. Don't need to hear that. No, seriously, now you're true? through your pain. <laughs> no, but I'd like to think... Could he, should he have left earlier? Right, I'm, not, I'm asking you... For his own football ambition. Kevin. No, not, not on Henrik Larson's behalf. You've got a football appreciation and brain and appetite that's beyond being a Celtic fan. From Broncos was always telling him, not just come here, come here, come here. Go, you should be somewhere else. What, retrospectively, how, do, you, do you still think he made the right choice? When you look at that Seville... Year when mm -hmm. we got to the final against Porto, mm -hmm. Larson's performance that night. It was off the scale, wasn't it? So his ambitions, I don't think anybody can question that. That he, oh, you should move on. Fair enough, people will be saying that to him because he could have played for any club. But I think he had a vision for Celtic that obviously the people that could make that happen never had. For Mark O'Neill and Henrik Larson and that squad, I think Seville should have been a starting point. Mm -hmm. We could have really built on that team. That's probably the closest my age group will ever see. Till it could have been the Porto team won the Champions League the following year. They did with very little retouches. The Liverpool team we beat two 0 at Anfield. They won the Champions League two years after with very little touches as well. Mm -hmm. So I think Larson was right to stay because great things could have been achieved at Celtic. It's a brilliant, brilliant answer. I used to go to the games, just be sitting, and no matter what was happening or who you were playing, you're still just going to Henrik's on. It'll be all right. Yeah. It's like been out with your mental pal. Nobody's going to start with you. I'm probably the only guy that's got his autograph on a first bus all day ticket. <laughs> there we go. Queuing up the car park. We were up to collect tickets one day, me and my mate Tony. We dogged the last two periods of school on a Friday. 
went up and the team were just leaving. Like they trained at Celtic Park that day. So we're sort of hanging about and we seen a bit of commotion. It was Larson, so the two is sprinted right up. But we never had pens or you never had smartphones at the time. All I had was my first bus all day ticket, Clyde Bank to Parkhead. So I was going, you know the way they just grab one pen and just sign everybody's autograph with the same pen? I'd handed it the all day ticket and he sort of looked at me because he had a marker <laughs> pen. And a first bus all day ticket's pretty narrow. So he's, he had to lean on his jeans, but he, they were light blue jeans and a tiny bit of the ink went off the all day ticket and on his blue jeans. I remember I was stomach churning. I was like, Henry, I'm so sorry. As if like, I'm ready to offer, like, I'll go to D2 and I'll buy you a new pair of jeans. Can you afford a new pair? Because I'll find the money somehow. H. He, just, he looked at me and I, he was more, this wee guy took this pretty bad because I was quite a nervous wee guy. And he's going, he's, he goes like, it's okay, it's okay. Then he gave me my all day ticket. So we're trying to get back on the bus. But Larson had obscured the date. So... The driver's not letting us on, and my three pals, uh, Tony and the other two, they're up there going, it's Henry Larson's autograph, mate, as if, like, you need to let him on. And the driver's going, Larson, he's, he's shite, I'm a Rangers man. So we're going, we're going, oh, mate, come on, he was only obviously having a joke and he waved us on, but... Only just, in Glasgow. It was the way my pals rounded round me, as if it should have been... Like, it's Henry Larson's Are you serious, come on? As if that's valid for You're a week. talking about, we should be able to drive it home. Can... Let Kevin in the driver's seat, it's, man. It's They're joking. Pass, man. So I've, I've still got it somewhere. <laughs> I've been very lucky with my job that I've met some true legends, and I mean proper legends, you know, like John Connery, Michael Caine, Robert Redford, like royally. But the only time I've ever... I was shaking when I met Henry Larson. I couldn't speak Gosh. to him. I, I could not speak to him. I couldn't function around him. Um, I, think for all, I think for all of us, who, let's say Scots are, yeah. are proud of a man of achievement, your achievements, and I, I think... I've explained to you that because I live abroad, I hadn't been aware of Line of Duty's emergence. When it came out, I hadn't seen the pre-publicity. When it came out, I, I, there's a, there's a, what a good actor that is. Yeah. And you were English, as far as I was concerned, <laughs> literally. And that must be given to you yeah. an awful lot. But we're, we're proud of Scots who achieve. And I think that it'll be pleasant for people who would be daunted meeting you and, and thrown by this famous guy, and we'll come on to Line of Duty in a minute, about the level of yeah. fame you said has gone off the scale with the, the last series. It'll be, it'll be nice for them to know that even the greats yeah. get a bit daunted around their heroes. Yeah, too. well, because I mean, it's, it's, I suppose it goes both ways. I think they, when, you, when you meet them, they all get a bit kind of flipping out about if they're watching TV. But yeah, I mean, especially sports stars, but if you're a football fan, you know, and when I kind of grew up, myself, it wasn't their best time, but then when the Anil era arrived and this team just kind of blew away everything before them. And I'd never seen them, and we had the new stadium. And before that, I mean, like being at Hamden and stuff, it was miserable, you know. Mm. And uh, I mean, my, my first, I got, I was called a Jonah after my after my first couple of games in the old jungle. I was a bit of boy, and I think we got, I remember we got beat by Motherwell after Carol Muggleton dropped the ball and Dougie Arnott scored. And then we got beat by Dun, Dundee United, Wayne Biggins missing a sitter. And I remember being in school singing Sack the Board. At primary school assembly, <laughs> you know, and um, and then this new area arrived with this new stadium, and yeah, Henrik Larson with his dreadlocks, and it was just it was something I'd never experienced before. And he's, I mean, maybe somebody like Dumbelli at the minute's got a shot, but we what is incredible what we got with Larson, we got his best years. He was mm. genuine, world class. What he went on to win the European Cup with Barca after us, mm. win the league with Man United, but we had him at his very best. And to see him at full flight was was magnificent. It really was. And I mean, I was behind the goal for the. Um, I was in the Jock Steen stand, which is the way Celtic shoot in the second half. And so I was directly facing that incredible goal he scored against Rangers in sixteen, where he took it down. He's not made contact and check cross, and it was just pure poetry in motion, you know. And we're not very well renowned in the west of Scotland for being the most open with our feelings, but we're sitting there with your big brother, and you know, you're just on the verge of tears of happiness, you know. It was magical. In training, not in matches, what, what were you beginning to think about that, this little dreadlock kid who played for Feyenoord? Because I guess you kind of had a massive exposure to Henke Larson uh, prior to that, and certainly this would be regarded as his breakthrough tournament. In private, in training, what were you beginning to think of him? I played him a few times in, in the Swedish league before we went there. And uh, 
He's the same age as me, but he broke through a little bit later than I in the national team in general, I think. But uh, then he lasted a lot longer than me as well. Uh, really good player who had a hard time uh, getting a starting place because we had two good players up front. We had uh, Martin Dallin and uh, Kenneth Anderson. Kenneth scored five goals and Martin four. Uh, hard to get in that team, but obviously you could see, you could see already then he was going to be a good player. Then again, he played for a dark side. But like he was made to play in midfield at Feyenoord, which is one of the reasons he, he, he left. And, and I, I wondered if, if you were seeing identical movement from him in training sessions, because I think he, I don't think it's talked about a lot, but I think he was an immensely bright footballer who figured out a lot about the game and chose, when I saw him, chose a, a, a completely different attitude how to play and behave at Celtic compared to Feyenoord. Then when he went to Barcelona, he had to relearn football. And I've watched him relearn it when, when Eto or Xavi wouldn't give him the balls when he was making a Celtic run. And he was used to saying, I've made that run, give it. And Celtic did because he just scored and won them things. And I believe that probably you were saying a Henrik Larsson in 94, and when you played him previously, he was quite different from the Henrik Larsson in, in the latter two thirds of his career. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think his uh, biggest uh, strength as a footballer was that he developed uh, into a thinking footballer. A thinking footballer who could adapt to to his environment, to adapt uh, against whoever he was playing to the opponent. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't the quickest. He wasn't the most skillful. He didn't have the hardest shot, but he, he was one of the most clever footballers I've seen, at least from Sweden. Uh, uh, he was really good at that, and he kept evolving the older he got as well. And that's that's why, if you look at it now, his best years were probably his last years in football, because uh, he developed all the time. Really good player, but back then he was more as an out and out striker, I'd say, out and out striker who wanted to get the the ball deep in front of goals and, and score. But they developed into a really, really good footballer. Without uh, I'm asking you to, to be anything stupid and dictate to Henrik, Henrik's back in this city now. And, um, you know, as a player, I, I don't know any player who was there as brief a time and began to have to impact as a substitute who was then literally adored. You're used to seeing Henke adored for Sweden, for the clubs that he scored for and coached at Manchester United too. But at Barcelona, at Celtic, it's, if you could encapsulate the same love that Celtic fans have for Henrik and say that over a smaller time, it felt the same at Barcelona. His impact was literally extraordinary. Now he's back having to help Ron Koeman Coach and Sufati, who is very new, but his talent is phenomenal. It needs to be guided and molded. He's back having to help Ronald Koeman deal with Leo Messi. What do you think um, Henrik brings to this situation at Football Club Barcelona? Because he had a relatively hard time as a coach back in Sweden, not reflecting on him necessarily, but it didn't go the way he wanted. Yeah, I think that's more due to the circumstances in the clubs he, he managed in, in Sweden than uh, his own knowledge of football, I think. Yeah, I think, uh, first and foremost, I'm very happy and proud because I'm a Swede after all. He's a friend of mine uh, that, we, that we have a guy who's actually part of the managing team in, in Barcelona and working. I, I'm, I still have, haven't fully understood what his exact role is in Barcelona, what's it going to be. But uh, I know Ronald uh, Koeman uh, trusts him and to work with young guys, uh, especially strikers, I think, I think he'll be the perfect uh, match. Uh, he's been there, he's done it as a player. Uh, oh no, I'm, I'm really happy for him. A little bit jealous as well. Would I be right in saying that because Henrik, I mean, his passion, his explosiveness, was all in his private life or in training. 
he's a very, he can put on a very cold clinical head and he also has a very reserved, careful manner uh, because he assesses and thinks. But bringing, not just plus one, bringing a man like that with his experience, but also his pretty cold, balanced clinical head into quite an explosive situation, that should be a help to the people around him that he isn't going to get swayed by all the nonsense that goes on around him, I think. That's uh, probably why they hired him. I think they need a, a cool guy in Barcelona. I mean, we all know what's uh, what happened last year. Uh, results haven't been there. Uh, it's been a turbulent season, and uh, I think he might be one of the guys to calm it down a little bit and get it moving forward again. Because uh, I think not only Barcelona needs it, I think uh, Spanish football, to be honest, need, needs it as well. Uh, need a club like Barcelona to to perform better than they, than they did last uh, season. trophies regularly but because that includes Aberdeen being deprived of them I prefer your European history that beautiful run to um, Sevilla is something really extraordinary for a Scottish team to go and, and beat Blackburn to win at Anfield if you look at that run as a personal memory what stands out what's the thing that makes you happiest or proudest or a moment when you went I can't believe this is happening I don't think I've ever said I can't believe this is happening. I think it was more of um, wondering at one point how far we can go. That's how confident that team was because we had one exceptional player, which another one, Henry Clarkson. Mm-hmm. And this guy was, every time we're in trouble, you come mm-hmm. up with something special. A goal, a pass, a performance. So we had somebody we can look up to and say, you know, having him, you know, we all put our shift, we all have our ability, but we've got something special there. And as long as we have him in the team, we've got a chance. Mm-hmm. And we've played some tough opponents, you know, just, you know, at the time I, I remember the Blackburn, the Liverpool, the Boa Vista, you know, Stuttgart, you know, it's, it's tough teams. Without, I remember Balakov playing for Stuttgart at the time, yeah, you know. Yeah. And um, we believed. The, the belief in that team that we can win games, that we can achieve something special, is enormous. We couldn't take a draw for success. That was the fit for us. And we had that in us. I think with the characters, with the winning to win, it was enormous. It was just so much. As a team, we knew each other inside out. The togetherness. We were just scared to let each other down, mm. which is a big thing in one team. And we had that. That's why a lot of teams at the moment struggle. And at that time, we had that. I wouldn't let, as playing as a midfield, I wouldn't let Lambert or Lennon down. Mm-hmm. I knew that every time we lose the ball, I need to be beside them. Mm-hmm. Because if I'm not there, I'm letting them down. And that'll be the same for them. If I lose the ball, they'll be right behind me because they know that, that, that I need the support. I knew that if Hendrik, if Hendrik go for a header, I need to be on second ball. Second ball. Because if I'm not, he'll be demanding. He'll come after the game, he'll tap me, and he'll say, next time when I flick it, you need to be there. And I knew that. And that's how demanding everybody was. Without saying too much, we knew what everybody required to do in that team. My comfort, or, or, or my comfort came when I could play in a partnership. I had good awareness of what was around me. I could, I could create chances. Um, you know, whether <laughs> I don't know whether people think that about me a lot, but I was, you know, I was, I was a focal point. I could slide people in, um, and I, I used to really enjoy. I used to, re- I, you know, I liked it from my young days at Norwich, uh, you know, linking up, and I, you know, I loved it. I, I liked it at Blackburn. And I think after the time I had at Chelsea, I had a really bad year at Chelsea where I lost a lot of confidence. I played with Gianfranco Zola. You think, well, how can anybody fail playing with Zola? But, and I'm not trying to say I was the same type of player. Of course I wasn't. But we both used to like to come to the ball. We used to like to be a, you know, a focal point. I did actually better at Chelsea for a brief, brief spell when George Weir came. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he would play off me. And, but then... When I moved to Celtic and I had this partnership um, with Henrik and 
you know, early on, early on at Celtic, at the time at Chelsea, I, 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 we were on a pre-season tour of Germany, and I met Henrik. I went to see Henrik on the coach, and just said, you know, I'm here, and I'd gone for a. Even though, even though I devalued four million pounds in a season, I'd gone for a Scottish record fee, yeah. and I wondered what he would, you know, what he would be thinking. So, you know, I went to him on you know, the first first day I was there and just said, you know, I'm not a threat to you. I, you know, I'll, I'll play you in. You know, I want to have a good relationship. And uh, from that day on, you know, I, I, that, that was the time I enjoyed most uh, mm. in my footballing career, and I enjoyed it most because of the bad spell I'd had at Chelsea. So I actually appreciated what I had. And I talk about taking things for granted. And I, took, I did take things for granted because, you know, after I'd made the early breakthrough, I thought everything, you know, was, was going to, to be easy and natural. And even though I'd had dips and, you know, I was lucky enough, I won the Premier League, I was 21 uh, in a partnership with Alan Shearer. But as I got older I, 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 um, and I'd developed... And I'd had the bad time. I appreciate. I was thankful for what I had. I was thankful that I'd been given another opportunity. Uh, but the chance to play with someone as clever mm. as Henrik, and Henrik was extremely, mm. extremely clever and gifted. You know, his natural talent. But he, and the other thing with Henrik is he was so unselfish with me. It was untrue. As unselfish as you were with him? Uh, yeah, I think so. But... I mean, I, I can, I can think about you know. I, I, uh, He's, you know, of course, he still wanted to be number one, but in terms of you know, so many, I mean, a lot of players could say how many goals he, he, he created, but you know, I just had, had that relationship with him where you know, he, he knew if I was, I'd, I'd square the ball to him and he would do absolutely likewise. Not, not think twice. You know, I was on my knees at the end at Chelsea because I was a laughing stock. When I started to enjoy my football again, mm. because I didn't enjoy not doing well. Who would enjoy that? No. When I started to enjoy it again, I actually, I was actually not angry with myself that I felt I coasted years at, 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 but I didn't appreciate what I mm. had. I loved it. I thrived, thrived on it. And then to play with, to, to have a partnership with Henrik Larsson. Incredible. To bonus. In, in terms of walking out on a pitch and, you know, I had it with Shearer, didn't appreciate it at 21. In terms of walking out on a pitch uh, against anybody, any team, in Europe, whatever I used to, I used to think, and you know, wouldn't wouldn't say it, but used to think. Uh, you know, I've talked a lot about being negative, but I, I used to think we could trouble anybody. Mm-hmm. I, we, we could without without saying it yeah. before the game. We just think if we if we're at it, we have, we have a good. You know, I, I know where you are. You know where I am. <laughs> 